Hey, everybody. Sorry for the delay. This is Sean Ash here live uh, coming to you from my uh, kitchen here. We're going to do our 13 Weather Academy. We're going to focus uh, on tornadoes today, and we're going to have some fun with experiments as well. Um, and if you didn't see the post yesterday, um, if you want to start working on it, hard-boiled egg. We're going to put this egg into the jar. I'm not going to use my hand and shove it down. I'm going to use air pressure to do the work for me here. So, but make sure it's hard boiled. You will need uh, some sort of heating element. I usually use something like this, or you can have matches. Um, and then we are going to crush. We're going to crush aluminum cans uh, with again with air pressure. You're going to need a heating element to heat these up. I'm going to use my stove, and uh, you'll need a a tub of ice cold water. Okay, and I'll show you how this is all going to work out. Uh, but it's all going to be air pressure. That's uh, part of the story here. I want to share a little story about myself. I grew up in Louisville, Kentucky. Um, and this book that I have was the inspiration for me becoming a uh, meteorologist and the event that it covered. And this book, about as old as I am, I was born in December of 73. This book was printed in 74. Uh, and it's about the April 3rd, 4th, 1974 tornado outbreak uh, that unfortunately um, – was uh, one of the biggest we've ever had on record. And so this book was at my grandmother's house growing up, and I used to flip through the pages as a young kid. She used to tell me stories about uh, flipping a couch over us to protect us from tornadoes that were nearby, and it just caught my attention, and uh, it gave me the weather bug at a very early age. All right, so uh, that's what uh, kind of triggered my curiosity. And you just never know what that will be for you regardless of what field you decide. So let's have some fun. I want to uh, share with you uh, one of my, I'm not a storm chaser. I did go out with storm chasers uh, at one point, and this was uh, several years ago. And uh, that's me in the central plains. And you can see around me is all kinds of other various types of weather. Uh, but that was on May 30th, of 2004. And I went out with a group from Ball State University. And I had pitched this story idea to go out with this class that they had that would go out and um, basically you're taking what you're learning in a textbook and you're putting it into a real life example. And so I had pitched this story idea multiple years and finally got to go ahead to go out with them. And we went out on a high risk day with them out in the plains. And um, and we, the, the day, go ahead, uh, Dale, go to that next slide. So May 30th, 2004, um, now, I would not do this now. I, I don't think smiling in front of a tornado is, is a real nice thing to do. But thankfully, this particular tornado, one of 11 that the group captured that day, uh, was out in the middle of the field and uh, did very little damage at all. But um, the, the group itself, this was one of the most successful chase days they've ever had, 11 tornadoes in about 90 minutes. And uh, it was just amazing to see it come to life from the forecast in the morning to a one supercell storm uh, that produced multiple tornadoes uh, as it moved across uh, the region here. So when I got into weather, um, when I first started studying meteorology, one of the questions that I had was, um, why does the wind blow? Seems like a simple question, and it will relate to this egg in a bottle experiment. It will relate to crushing the can because it's all about air pressure and uh, the difference in pressure, okay? So, um, you know, I'm a meteorologist. I'm definitely not an artist, but I did my best on this next slideshow um, to show you how this works. So I always tell people, take, you know, put your thinking caps on, and we have two tanks of water side by side. One on the left has a little bit of water in it. The one on the right... Um, has the bigger, you know, it's almost full to the top. There's a tube that's kind of uh, putting a stop between the two tanks. And if you take that tube out, what will happen to the water is that the weight of the heaviest one will rush over into the lighter one and it will equalize. And that difference in weight or that difference in pressure uh, is what creates wind, okay? Go to the next one, Dale. And we'll show them again. So when I show you these tanks, uh, try to visualize the one on the left being low pressure and the one on the right being heavy pressure. I go to the next one. 
So this is what it would look like on the weather map. Low pressure basically is just lighter air. High pressure is heavy air. Now heavy air, when it sinks down, typically puts a lid on cloud development. So usually when we have a high pressure area over us, we have sunshine. Just the opposite when the air is lighter and it's rising, it forms clouds and it sometimes it can form thunderstorms. So with that said, and we talk about the difference in weight of air, we're gonna get to our first experiment here. Uh, it's the egg in a bottle experiment. And again, if you, you know, if you can't do it now, what you'll do, you gotta hard boil the eggs. You wanna, I usually, a glass jar is certainly gonna work better than plastic. So do it, use a glass jar um, and you can use matches. I've seen some people that will take matches and they'll put the matches, light them and put them inside of the, of the two or the bottle. Um, and then all that we're basically doing is creating a difference in pressure. So hot air rises because it's light. So what we're going to try to do here is make the air pressure inside of the bottle lighter than the outside so that the when the when it, the air pressure is lighter inside the weight of the air outside which is cooler and heavier will force the egg into the bottle okay and i'm going to try to do this without setting off the uh, the fire alarms here give me a moment i'm going to open up my windows all right create a little air now i tell you sometimes in the you know, last uh, year and a half, I do my school talks. I've been having some issues getting this thing to stay lit inside the bottle. So what I have done and what you can do, if you're, if you're holding the bottle, you can put your heating element under it, and it's going to create the same effect. All right? So hopefully we can get this puppy on the first try. And the joke that uh, I'm sure the kids at home are tired of hearing, or the uh, kids when I do school talks, but I always make a, a wager with them. Hey, if I get the egg in the bottle, no school uh, for the rest of the year. And of course, they get very, very excited. But then I say there's a flip side of that wager. If if the egg goes into the bottle, um, you have to go to school um, for, for the rest of the year. So uh, kind of some funny stuff. All right, let's try it here. Let me tilt my camera down. Let me go a little bit more here. All right. So hope this will work for us. All right. Yeah, if you're trying this at home, kids, make sure you have mom and dad with you. All right, we're going to put our egg. All right. So you want to keep that. There you go. Look at that. We're good on the first try. Look at that. Boom. All right. I mean, a pay raise. There you go. So the egg is now in the bottle. Okay. Now. So I, you know, I told you that I had the joke with them. So the kids would be like, "Oh no, we got to go to school the rest of the year." So I always say, "Hey, I'm, I'm a good guy. Uh, I'm gonna, I'm gonna do you a favor. If I can get it out, we'll just call the bet even." And what we're going to do is reverse the process. We're going to make the air pressure inside of the bottle higher to push it out. And, then, and how you do that? My wife would tell you I'm full of hot air. So why am I doing this? So all I'm going to do is get the egg toward the bottom here, all right, and then I'm going to blow air. I'm going to just blow a bunch of air in there with the hope of we get the pressure higher and it pushes it out. Let's see if we can get this down here on the first track. And while I'm doing that, let me turn on my my uh, my heating elements back here for our other experiment too, because I want to heat these up, heat the cans up. All right, so ready? Here we go. Close, close, close. Let's try it again. Oh, there we go. <laughs> I tell you, that doesn't taste too well. All right. That's why you're using a hard-boiled egg. All right. So, again, we're using air pressure. Okay. Now, the next experiment, and again, all, whoop, oh, boy, there we go. Yeah, that's, that's what I was afraid. Hey, Nick, can you do me a favor? Oh boy. Just open up some windows here, partner. Woo! What is it? Gotta love live television. I was afraid of that. Yeah. I know, I know, I know, I know. Do me a favor. Yeah, just open some windows and take these by the smoke detector over there. Woo! Yeah, just, yeah, just, just see that right now. All right, 
right, sorry guys, we're okay. You gotta love Facebook Live. Everybody, how's your Tuesday going? <laughs> okay, now let's uh, let's get back to our task at hand. So uh, I'm heating up our cans over here. We're going to do the same thing. So the so the air inside the can is going to be lighter compared to the ice cold water that we're using in our bucket. So when I take the can and we put it in the water, it's going to the pressure outside is just going to squish the can. So, grab our gloves, put this over here. <laughs> it's fine. All right. All right, so, here we are. Make sure you guys can see it here, okay? Turn off my first heating element. Hopefully our neighbors aren't freaking out either here. Okay, you guys ready? Boom. See that? So again, air pressure, pressure outside of the can um, greater than inside. So that force, that difference in pressure is what caused it to crush the can. We'll try it again. Okay. Here you go. Gotta use the tongs. You guys ready? Boom. Two for two on that, okay? All right, so again, um, using air pressure, which again is the what, why we have the wind, gets back to our, our story there. So fun times here. All right, let's, uh, let's move on. So hopefully you enjoyed the experiment, and if you're just tuning in, we'll, we'll, we've got links to it on our, on our website uh, as well. So let's talk about, let's take some of those examples, and difference in pressure sometimes is a relation to difference in heating. So how do clouds form? Um, so on a day like today, where some of us had sunshine in the morning and it heated up the ground in relative terms and it causes that air to rise, okay? And when that air rises, it gets to a certain point we call the condensation. And when it hits that, that's when uh, it cools down and the, the vapor, the water, the invisible vapor condenses into cloud drop. Okay. Now, sometimes, as I was telling you, sometimes the air around us is not terribly light or low pressure, but other times it is. And so when you have enough lift, enough moisture, like we are going to have in the coming days, uh, you can get thunderstorms. Now, some thunderstorms aren't harmful. They just bring lightning and they get loud and uh, they produce heavy rain. Now, sometimes the storms can be severe and they can produce what are called downburst wind. And basically that is just a rush of rain cooled air rushing toward the ground and why they can be dangerous, not only to homes and why uh, airplanes definitely, if you've ever been in an airplane, sometimes they will navigate around storms and that is why not only the lightning threat, but the downburst, that heavy uh, rush of air um, it can be very disruptive to planes, okay? Now, I mentioned we're gonna focus a lot on tornadoes. So that downburst is when the storm is kind of collapsing, all right? Now, how we uh, form a tornado, you gotta have moisture, you have to have lift, you have to have what we call instability, and you need wind shear, okay? Now, the example that I'm showing you right now with this animation, give me just a second here. Grab a, grab a pen. So you need wind coming from different directions. That creates the wind shear. And it's horizontal initially. And then when you have enough lift and enough wind shear around the storm, it will take that horizontal tube and pull it into a vertical. Okay? Dale, come back out real quick because I want to show them an example here. Um, so 
think of that horizontal tube and that wind shear like a pencil or a pen, and you're doing this, and that's kind of that example, right? So it's invisible initially. And we've got this going on at the ground, and then as it's getting pulled up, it's like a figure skater almost. So that wind shear, if there's enough, and, it, and, and that's the thing, we have some of the most amazing minds that had been studying supercell storms, storms in general for decades. And there's a lot more that we know due to their work about the formation of tornadoes, but they will tell you there's still a lot more that we need to know. So uh, why some storms will produce a tornado and why others don't is still a fascination to them. And that's why you will have storm uh, chasers out, not only to provide uh, weather information to the warning process, but there's a lot of research that's still going on, okay? And so when they pull that into the vertical, the, the thunderstorm, it's like a figure skate. You know, when the arms are out here, it's a slower spin. When the arms come in, it's a quicker spin, all right? So um, so let's talk a little more about tornadoes now that we know how they're formed. Um, it, this is what a tornado basically is. Uh, they can happen, I always tell people, they can happen anywhere at any time if the conditions are right. Okay, and they're more right. Uh, they come together more often here in the United States than anywhere else in the world. Okay, there's a lot of myths about the tornadoes that we like to debunk. Um, I mentioned any time. Yes, we can have tornadoes in the winter. We have had tornadoes in the winter here in Indiana. We've had them in every single month. Now, we are definitely getting into our severe weather season despite how cool it is. Um, but yes, March through uh, early June, peak for us here. There's another peak that happens in the fall. Can the same place be hit? Uh, that can happen. Yeah, this is Zeni, Ohio, 1974. That was part of that outbreak that I talked about that intrigued me. And then just a couple of years ago. And uh, big cities, by the way, can also have tornadoes. And we've seen that happen uh, in the past. And uh, the example that we're, the next example we're showing you, that is Miami, Florida, 1997. Salt Lake was hit by a big one, Fort Worth, too. So it can happen, it can happen um, across uh, the country in, in big cities. Now, where they happen more often or not, uh, out in Oklahoma, and back in May 3rd, 1999, one of the, one of the strongest winds ever measured, um, the estimate over 300 miles per hour, but also had some measurements that were near 300 with radar. This is what that tornado looked like, by the way. This was near Moore, Oklahoma. And you probably have heard about Moore, unfortunately, many times. Um, not far from Moore, Oklahoma, just a couple, few years ago, the widest tornado on record, 2.6 miles wide. That was the El Reno, Oklahoma tornado, okay? And um, let me show you what that looked like. Again, over two and a half miles wide. Now, what uh, typically produces tornadoes are something we call supercell storms. And we don't see a lot of structure like this here locally. But when you go out in the plains, this is what it can look like. That's what the storm looks like. We can see inside that storm that you can almost see it's rotating. We use radar to uh, help us get an early warning on this. And this is what that looks like from a presentation standpoint. This is called hook echoes. And you may hear us when we're in severe weather coverage talk about the hook. And that uh, is from a supercell storm. The debris ball, the radar now can see and pick up debris that's being um, circling, circling, circling the uh, tornado. And then uh, you know we we know where the hail core is and the and the and the heavy rain. Another tool that we have with Live Doppler 13 radar uh, that we use is something called shear rate. And what it does, it takes a lot of the wind radar data and it gets rid of a lot of the clutter and it helps us focus on areas uh, of most wind shear. Now that wind shear could be producing straight line wind. It could also be producing twisting wind. So it really helps us show the viewer um, where the areas of most concern would be, okay? And then another product that we have that we will use is something called a shear marker. And again, this basically is picking up on wind shear, uh, areas of, of wind shear to, to notice, okay? And this was an example of a storm that was approaching from, from eastern Illinois. And as we get closer to the radar, that cone will go shrink down and when you get it lower to the ground, 
that gives you a little higher confidence uh, that we may have uh, something that uh, could be producing a tornado. Okay, so these are some of the tools that uh, we will use. Okay, if we never have to use them again, but we know that we probably will, that we're getting severe weather season. All right, and this was an example. This was from August of 1996. What you're looking at is red and green wind velocities. Remember I mentioned the figure scare? This is what it looks like on a radar example of uh, a storm that was producing a uh, tornado. Montgomery County. Uh, you can see, in fact, I wouldn't be shocked if this thing might be on the ground right now, just south of Crawfordsville, west of Mace and Whitesville. Uh, now, east of 231 is where we're getting uh, the signature there. They see the red is the outbound wind and the green next to each other. That's the inbound. So that would be where we have the tightest circulation. That's going to be right in this area, right here, is where the storm's rotating. This is moving. and it's overshooting the circulation toward the ground. And that particular day, that was an example. Our Chuck Lofton um, was up in Swayze, and he caught this tornado. And the radar, again, was overshooting this circulation that was uh, close to the ground. It wasn't a real deep circulation. And Chuck was calling back and was like, hey, man, we've got the tornado here. And so that's why we will send crews out at a safe distance to try to verify what the radar is showing and what the radar may not even be seeing, okay? All right, so that, again, that was from uh, August August of 2016. Uh, so when we get into severe weather, um, I want to talk about what you need to know, watches versus warnings, okay? So I always like to use the, uh, the cookie ingredients. So a watch is basically when you have all your ingredients out to make cookies or brownies, okay? So a, a watch means conditions are favorable to produce tornadoes. And then a warning is like we put everything together to make our brownies. And so a warning means either the radar uh, is detecting strong rotation or spotters have picked up on it. So that's the difference between a watch versus a warning. Watch, get everything ready. Make sure you have your plan. A warning, put those plans into place. All right. Um, so very important to know the difference and have a way to get those, by the way. So, and where should you go in your, your home? All right. We always say if you have a, a basement's most preferable, if you do have the basement, if not, you just go to the lowest level, but the basement is the most preferable, uh, spot to, to go to in your home. And, uh, we'll show you on the animation here. Uh, the idea basically is just get as low as you can. And um, we always tell people too, within your safe room of your house, wherever that safe spot, you know, have your pillows and your blankets and your bicycle helmets. If you don't have the basement, put as many walls between yourself and the outside part of the, the home. All right, and to get away from windows, that's very important as well. Um, so that's that's our tornado safety. Now, uh, another aspect of severe weather is is hail. We talked about downburst wind. These are some examples of hail sizes. And I've actually been in baseball before. Uh, and a baseball sized stone travels toward the ground at about 100 miles per hour, very destructive. The largest uh, hailstone on record, over eight inches. And uh, this is what that one looked like uh, from North Dakota, uh, excuse me, South Dakota back in 2010, eight inch diameter. Now, if the stone's big enough and you Cut it in half. Go to the next one, Dale. You cut this thing in half, you'll see rings, almost like the rings of a uh, tree stump. And you know, the, those tell you how old the tree is. Well, the rings with inside a uh, hailstone can tell you how many trips up and down the thunderstorm um, that, that this particular stone went. And that's how it works. The stronger the uh, wind going into the storm, the stronger, um, the longer it can loft it up and, and, and keep it, keep that stone up. Okay. So watches and warnings, we also want you to know about the various levels of severe weather. We don't get level five around here a lot, um, thankfully, but when we do, um, you know, that's the highest you can go. That's, that's either meaning we're gonna get a, a widespread high wind or a tornado outbreak, but even on the level one risk, um, you know, any risk of severe weather, you need to have a way to get watches and warnings and be weather aware. And that's what we try to do day to day. When we have the big events, this is how we cover them. You know, we'll have you know, teams either out in the field or inside 
started the studio, and uh, we are doing not only television. We're doing we're doing now. We're doing Facebook. We're doing all of our social media, and we have our live Doppler 13 mobile storm track van as well um, that can get in behind these storms and follow them as needed. Now, um, I also like to kind of bring you into the studio because when we're there, it's a little bit different than what you might think. So we're not standing in front of the maps. Uh, we're actually standing in front of a, what's called the chroma key or a green wall. We can't wear the color green. And um, we are superimposed in front of that. So basically what we see, when we're turning sideways and it looks like we're staring you know, right at a map, we're actually looking at monitors on each side of us. And we see what you see at home, which is us in front of those maps. So that's what we call the chroma key magic. Our job can be a lot of fun. Now this is an early shot of me in my career. I had no idea we were this close to a lightning bolt. That's a couple of football fields away. And um, I would never do that again, trust me. If, uh, we always say thunder roars, get indoors. And this was an example of me just not uh, being smart enough to take my own advice. But we do enjoy the weather. I wanna talk a little bit, uh, our friends Citizen Energy Group helping us with our Weather Academy. We wanna talk about water conservation, okay? The ocean make up 70% of the uh, of the earth and only one percent of our water on earth is available for drinking so whatever we can do to help conserve water and maybe that's taking a quicker shower which we try to do with our our family here we try to make them as quick as possible we uh, try to take our water bottles with us when we need uh, water and uh, we do our best to, to help conserve and hopefully you can too as well all right all right we also want to say uh thanks to our, our, our friends and partners at the Indiana Fever, they're gonna kick off our Q&A session. So let's get that started. When the fever hit the court, we hit like a fast moving tornado. Do you know what they call a tornado that's over water? That's a great question. And uh, the answer is what you're seeing right there. It is a water spout, okay? I mentioned Miami, 1997. Uh, it was a water spout and it can actually be a tornado too. So if it's over, if it's basically just a tornado, but it's over water, but if it comes on land, then it's a tornado and it can be both, okay? So that is what a tornado over water is. Let's go to the next question. The fever are always driving in the lane, but do you know where Tornado Alley is? Uh, Natalie, great question. And, and you know what, Indiana, Definitely within Tornado Alley. I mentioned the U.S. has the, the ingredients uh, that, that occur, tornadoes occur more frequently than anywhere else. You get that out in the plains. That's where you get the collision of the Gulf moisture, or Canadian air, and that's where we can get some big storms. And Tornado Alley, by the way, uh, especially the violent tornadoes are expanding toward the east. We've noticed that in the last 10 plus years. Uh, Alabama, Mississippi, parts of Georgia, and Tennessee as well. Okay, one more question from our friends, the Fever. When the Fever play, it's always hot. But do you know why you see your breath when it's cold outside? And now we're turning this thing full circle. That basically it's back to condensation, all right? So we have moisture uh, in our breath. And uh, when we blow out, and sometimes it doesn't have to even be on a winter day, just uh, when it blows out, it condenses into droplets. And, uh, and that's what we're seeing, okay? Um, but that's always a good sign. All right, let's see what we have here. Let's say hello to some of our friends. I see Debbie and see Joe. And Mitch is asking a good question about severe weather. Uh, yeah, you know, and sometimes uh, La Nina or El Nino, sometimes that's one component. Um, but we have, you know, there's there's been different years, like El Nino sometimes will bring big severe weather to, uh, to central Indiana, but sometimes it's also what's happening elsewhere across, across the globe too, uh, Mitch. That's a good question. Hey, Deb and Alexandria, good to see you guys. All right. Oh, okay. Uh, the hail on Mother's Day, that's actually what we, uh, what we call grapple, okay? And um, sometimes you don't need thunder for that. You need cold air aloft. And that grapple, I always say, is like dipping dots, okay? It's just a, uh, it's a little more of a powdery ice ball that falls compared to a severe thunderstorm uh, where it's more of like an ice chunk. And that's what we were seeing 
Uh, that's what we were seeing from uh, the storms or the, the cells that we had from uh, Mother's Day. Kelly, hey, good to see you there in Lafayette. Maya, hello. Good to get your five-year-old. All right, Annette from 84, good to see you guys. Kim, good to see you. Trafalgar, nice. Uh, looks like my wife joined in too. Yeah, good to see you guys. Uh, Paul's asking about the Blue Angel flyover today, which is going to be between 2 and 2.11 around the metro area. There's going to be two passes over downtown Indy, by the way. Um, we should be fine. Um, there's cloud ceiling, I've been told. 1,000 feet is what they're comfortable with, and they sometimes may even go below that in certain instances. I think we'll be fine. It may not be necessarily sunny, but I think we're probably going to be okay. Um, to get to get the show off here, and again, that's between two and and two eleven. All right. I hope uh, I hope everybody enjoyed. <laughs> hope you enjoyed the fire alarm too. Uh, we're good here. We're good here. Hey, I'm going to be on the noon show, uh, so hopefully you can tune in for that. And uh, I'll try uh, to get on later. If I missed any questions, I'll try to hop on here. And don't forget that our weather presentations are always available at the link. So we uh, we certainly appreciate you guys and. And hopefully uh, all of us are kind of making it through this together. Okay, we'll see you at noon on Channel 13. Hope you can join us. Take care.